Money is not the root of all evil. It also isn't the solution to all of the world's problems. It's simply a store of value. So if you've created value in the marketplace, you have stored that value via money. But but money alone is nothing unless we use that money to serve our values, unless we use that money to create the life that we want to create. Have you ever thought about how your relationship to money is impacting your ability to earn, your ability to create wealth in your business, and your ability to truly find enjoyment in the things that you're doing to generate revenue? Now, I'm saying this and asking this, kind of posing this hypothetical question for a very specific reason. Are you wealthy? Well, the definition is up to you. Hey there, I'm Tracy Matthews. I'm the Chief Visionary Officer of Flourish and Thrive Academy, and I help jewelry business owners launch, grow, and scale successful six and seven figure businesses using my methodology called the Desire Brand Effect. And I love talking about things that are holding members of this community. So I have a very special guest on the show today. He is a serial entrepreneur, a former Navy pilot, and also the founder of Unbreakable Wealth. He's going to be talking about the issues that are preventing us from actually creating wealth in our lives, which we all need to do. So let's dive into this episode with Mike. It is incredible. You're going to love it. All right. I'm super excited to be here today with my friend, Mike Brown. Mike, welcome. Thanks, Tracy. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show because, you know, one of the things that you are really focused on is money mindset and building wealth um, as an entrepreneur. And you have an interesting background and you're now moving into a new direction, coaching people on how to build wealth. And I thought this would be a really interesting conversation as we're kind of rounding out 2023 and launching into 2024 to chat with you just to talk about some money stuff because everyone wants to avoid the money stuff especially when they're creative <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's not a place that's polite to talk about right like we're, there's yeah. three things we're never supposed to discuss politics yep. uh, religion and money and so we do tend to avoid it as a society because it brings up discomfort and it's really in those conversations leaning in that we can start finding the places where we're limiting ourselves around the money. I love that. Well, before we dive in, I'm going to do the intro and outro after, but just share a little bit about your experience and your background as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So in a former life, I flew jets for the Navy. I flew F-18s from 2003 to 2011. I got out and uh, moved back to my hometown in Midland, Texas, and I started an oil and gas company which I sold in 2019 in an eight-figure exit. And at that time, I started coaching and really realized that there was one common thread that was constantly holding all of my clients mm. back. And it was really this money mindset and personal finance, and that was bleeding over into business. And so mm. one thing that I, I found as I work with more and more clients was that really there are very few business problems. I used to say there's no business problems. Yeah. There are business problems like global pandemic when the when the government shuts down your business, that's a business problem. Yep. But there are very few business problems. Most problems that entrepreneurs face are personal beliefs or limitations that show up and manifest in their business and specifically around finance. So so that kind of just evolved over time. I started hosting retreats focused on finance and now basically have moved into wealth coaching full time because uh, there was just such a need in the marketplace. I love that. I mean, I've known you for many years because we're in a business group together called Baby Bathwater. And we probably started a little bit on this healing journey in like space where we're working on some mindset issues. And I would love to know just in your experience, like, what do you think the biggest mindset issues that are preventing entrepreneurs from actually reaching their full potential from a leadership standpoint and also from a wealth building standpoint? Like, what does that really mean to you? It looks very different for different people, but mm -hmm. it all comes down to the same thing. So at, at my first wealth building retreat, there, there were two people. One of them was making 16 million a year and spending oh, wow. 17 million. Wow. And the other had just sold his company for 16 million and it was all in a bank account. And he told us that his greatest fear was that he couldn't send his kids to college. And oh, all wow. of us exist <laughs> somewhere on that spectrum, right? Like we either have this easy come, easy go mentality where, where it's just money in, money out, or there's this deep you know, scarcity, there can never be enough uh, fear-based mentality. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just really a spectrum. But basically, 
both of those people could could relate back to childhood beliefs that manifest for them today. Yes. So whether you're on the you know freewheeling spending end or on the the more scarce you know money is mm-hmm. precious and we have these beliefs that run in the background that, that cause us to self sabotage and keep us from building that true wealth or hitting the next level in our business. So I'll give you another example. I had a client that every day of their life, their dad would sit around at the dinner table and just talk about how evil rich people were. And if, yeah. if rich people had money, it was because they had exploited someone. It was because they were exploiting the workers, you know, mm-hmm. and, and just painted this picture. So their whole life, they grew up with this idea that to, to be rich, you had to be evil. Yeah. Well, fast forward 20 years, they've started a successful business and they are constantly finding a way to drain their bank account. No matter how much money they make, there's never enough mm-hmm. because you know, if they actually start to build wealth, now they're letting their father down. They're becoming an evil person in their father's eyes, right? So yeah. that's an example of a limiting belief. That is, that's huge. You know, it's really interesting that you say this about the two, the two wide ends of the spectrum, right? Like the people who are spending way more than they're making and then the people who are just like hoarding everything and like probably running like the most bootstrap business or whatever. And it reminds me of a story from a designer who will remain anonymous that we helped, you know, she, we just had an event here in Scottsdale. She walks up to me, like we're taking a picture and she's like, Tracy, I have to thank you. You've made me a millionaire. Like I'm literally almost a millionaire. And I was like, and I know the numbers of her business and that didn't really calculate, but she was kind of on the end of the spectrum where she was not spending anything. And was literally her business was so profitable because of everything that she learned from me, which is great. But she almost was trapped in this fear of like never having enough and like living very frugally and also like not really enjoying the fruits of her labor. Like she's just working hard to like stockpile a bunch of money, which is great because that does offer some security, but there's got to be a balance. Totally. And this is. So, you know, one thing that we hear a lot, especially in kind of this world of, of personal finance is that abundance is good and scarcity is bad. And if you mm-hmm. just have abundance, you're going to solve all of your problems. <laughs> and if you think more abundantly, then the money is going to start flowing. And if if you have these, you know, scarcity, that's just a limiting belief. You've got to get rid of that. And and I really disagree. I, I think that there needs to be a healthy balance, right? Mm-hmm. Because in my own journey, you know, I fell more on this, this spectrum of invest fast, you know, yeah. easy come, easy go. And the fact is like, I could have used more scarcity in my mindset yeah. because I wasn't respecting the power of the money that I was making. So, exactly. so this inherent idea that scarcity is bad, I think is a, a real misnomer and, and leads people astray. Scarcity can be a superpower. Like if you reframe that, it means that you're a good steward of your resources and that mm-hmm. you're respecting the power of money, but you have to make sure that it's not limiting your growth. Exactly. Right? And so what I would encourage that person to do is, is to be able to, you know, hold on to some of those things that, that serve her in her business, like being a good steward of her resources, but looking at the places where she could reinvest and spend in order to create, you know, a better life for herself mm-hmm. and her family, or, grow the business even faster. You know, those are two places where we want to eliminate those limiting beliefs. So it really is all about balance. I love that. You know, I was talking with another different type of finance person. She's more like on the accounting spectrum. Yesterday, we're just having a meeting about something else. And she was saying, talking about the different profit drivers in her business. And she's like, you know, sometimes when I get on calls with people, you know, really the issue, like a lot of the issues that they're having with their profitability in their company are mindset issues. And many times it's not even that they're bad with their money. It's just, they're not making enough money. So like, where, what's the stem of that? Mm-hmm. Like to find the balance of like being in a good mindset where you're generating enough resources and wealth, being able to run your business efficiently so that it's profitable. And then also, what was the third one? Um, I forget, but it doesn't really matter. But like finding that balance between like, I don't know, being responsible and like generating the wealth and all those things. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say for any size business, uh, the first thing is for regardless of whether you're the CEO or not, like you need to know your numbers, like mm-hmm. the CEO needs to know their numbers. And what I see, you know, rampantly, even in, you know, high six, seven, even eight figure businesses, yeah. 
is that people will outsource their confidence. They'll hire an outsourced CFO, they'll hire mm -hmm. a bookkeeping or an accounting firm, and then they'll wait you know, for, that, for them to compile reports. They'll send them over, they'll glance at them, and they'll never really understand yeah. what the numbers of their business are. And it turns out there's only like three or four numbers that every business mm -hmm. needs. And they may be different depending on your business, but really there's some version of money in, money out, and you know, runway, basically, like how like how much you have in the bank and how long yeah. you can not make money before you run out of money. Like mm -hmm. knowing those numbers cold, you really don't need to know a whole lot else. And yeah. and so what I encourage any business owner to do, even if you're just starting out, is to build yourself a spreadsheet. And it's really important that you build it yourself because you understand how mm -hmm. those like four numbers end up affecting your business rather than hiring an expensive accountant and having them send you a report. Like when I, even, even like today, like I'm, I'm a finance person. And when I get the, the itemized P and L for my account, it makes my eyes bleed. Like yeah. I only want to know those three or four numbers that truly matter. And then I can make decisions based on those numbers, but I'm owning those numbers. Like I'm not outsourcing my confidence to somebody else. So that's exactly. Step it's important to be looking at your numbers every single week. I just wrote a note down here. I'm like, oh, maybe this is something we should add to our programs, like tips on how to build your own financial spreadsheet. Yeah. So, so like a very common one is a 13 week cash yeah. flow. That's how, that's how most businesses mm -hmm. operate. But again, rather than downloading a template, like I actually encourage people to make their own because there's something just really cool about filling in the formulas yourself and like understanding oh, how each, each cell is calculated. You are like, making. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be super complicated. <laughs> you are making creatives over here cringe right now. They're like, I don't know Excel or spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, there's a there. You know, like I said, you, you certainly can download a template, but you know, chances are you won't truly understand that yeah. spreadsheet, and so it's not going to be serving you. And it doesn't have to be 64 tabs. Like it can be a single tab, one page overview. Mm -hmm but with those four numbers that matter. And like it, 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 you know, you can estimate your sales over the last 12 months and go, okay, you know, if I've been doing 20 K a month, like I can expect that I'm going to be doing 20 K a month over the next yeah. 12 weeks. Here's my expenses over the last year and just start building it out from there. Exactly. So what is like, you've worked with a lot of people in their wealth building on their wealth building journey. Are there like specific steps that you walk them through to help them <clears throat> develop well to clear their mindset issues and all these things prevent self-sabotage like what does that look like yeah i mean there's there's the tactical and practical and then there's the mindset right and those mm -hmm. are, are, are really two different things and and what i try and do is marry the two worlds but you know what i what i often say is that if information was all that we needed to be wealthy there'd be a whole lot more rich people because there is mm -hmm. so much information out there about what to do with money how to get rich and nobody follows it. And the reason yeah. they don't follow it is because of these mindset beliefs, like these limiting beliefs that run in the background and create mm -hmm. self-sabotage. So I definitely think the first step for any entrepreneur to truly understand their finances is to understand how they relate to money and where those beliefs come from and where they show up for you now. So, so one of my favorite questions is to ask, how did I grow up with money and what beliefs did that form? And then how do those show up for me in my day-to-day -day life now? And just that exercise can be really telling about, you know, if you grew up poor in a very wealthy town, or if you grew up very wealthy in a poor town, like both of those things can really shape how you relate to money nowadays. And so just having the awareness and insight as to where those came from can be incredibly helpful, but awareness and insight don't do anything without the next mm -hmm. step, which is action. Yeah. So, you know, you know, just like the four numbers I told you about, uh, there has to be a step, like what decisions am I making based on this? And, and it can be really exciting to get stuck in like, oh, my dad did this with money and my mom did this. And, and people mm -hmm. continually dig for that insight, but then there's no step to be like, no. okay, how see how this shows up for me now. Now what, now what do I do? How do I, how do I correct this behavior? How do I change or stop doing the thing that uh, I inherited from my parents. So that's that's number one. And then on the practical, more tactical, strategic side, the number one thing I see from entrepreneurs is not enough liquidity. So mm -hmm. liquidity is defined as anything that you can access in 24 hours. And like, I understand this because what happens is 
as we're growing and building a business, we are constantly cash strapped, right? We're turning over inventory, we're spending mm -hmm. money on marketing. So we're used to going down to zero and like, and staring mm -hmm. at the bank account and like waiting for the next thing to come in. The problem is we, this is called the normalization of deviance. We get so used to being cash strapped, the same thing bleeds over into our personal life. And so as we start to take profit out of that business, we go reinvest in other people's businesses. We go reinvest mm -hmm. in real estate or other assets where we can't get our money in case of emergency. So yeah. it's really important to be able to access your capital. So first steps for, for any entrepreneur is to build 12 months of comfortable living expenses in an, a liquid asset. So that could be stock market ETFs. That could be a high yield savings account. You know, if, if you don't want to risk any of it, it can stay in a, in a savings account, but everyone needs at least 12 months of mm -hmm. living expenses. And if you don't have that, like do not pass go, don't invest in anything else. Don't invest in your friend's hair brain idea, brand new company. <laughs> like just keep stacking cash until you have 12 months living expenses. After that, I like to now have six months of business operating expenses li liquid. Mm -hmm. And then, and then just continue building from there. So like entrepreneurs have this idea that liquidity means lower returns or that they have to invest in these, in these crazy things in order to, to beat the market and, and get returns. And it's basically not true. So, so most entrepreneurs don't have enough liquidity. That's the first place to start. Okay. Awesome. Now I'm sure that you've been on this journey yourself. Like what are some of the mistakes that you've made? in your business you mentioned you had an eight-figure exit so yeah. that's a lot of cash <laughs> sitting around and stuff it going is. on so whatever you're willing to share like what what happened there yeah i mean this all of this uh i can i can proudly say is born of my own experience right. uh you know when i sold my company i thought i would never be unhappy again and I thought that and it sounds silly now, but like, I thought that because that's what society tells yeah. us. Like, like if we just yeah, hit money. X amount of money, mm -hmm. like all of our problems are going to be solved and I'll, I'll finally be able to do this or that. And, you know, look, I, I can, I can say like selling a company for that much money is an incredible experience, but I wasn't a different person yeah. after I sold. And so, you know, if selling that company didn't fill me up, if it didn't fill up that hole inside of me that I thought was going to be filled by hitting, you know, this external success. Now I had to start digging into the deep work of, okay, who am I without my company? Who am I without my mm -hmm. achievements? Like who am I truly at the core and diving in and, and look that that work can be really uncomfortable. And then, and then the second thing that happened is I kept deploying my capital as I was before I sold, except for now there was no more money coming in. So I was investing in startups. I was investing in crypto. I was investing in basically any deal that came across my desk. Mm. I was the guy putting money into it. And two years after my exit, I got in a situation where I was completely cash strapped. I, I bought a failing e-commerce company that I was trying to turn around. I was losing hundred K a month. Wow. I was building this house, which, you know, with the love of my life, it was amazing except for my builder was coming to me every mm. week with cost overruns and, you know, the bills started stacking up and like all of a sudden, even though I'm a multimillionaire on paper, like I can't access yeah. any of my capital. And so, you know, that's when I started diving into this journey of like, wait a minute, if I can build this successful investment firm, why haven't I applied these principles to my personal life? Mm -hmm. That's a great, like, a great lesson right there. Well, how did it end up? I mean, you're doing great now, but like, how did it end up turning out? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, two things. One, I, I read every personal finance book I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. I went to coaching. I went to therapy. Like I started, I dug in and, and did the work and yeah. realized, you know, as I said earlier, it wasn't knowledge that I was lacking. Mm -hmm. It was these self-sabotaging patterns yeah. that I inherited from growing up. So like, you know, when I was growing up, my parents fought a lot. Yeah. And they only fought about one thing. Money. Money. Totally. Sounds familiar, so, Mike. <laughs> right? And so I, 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 you know, my, my child self sees my parents fighting about money. And I, and I made a promise to myself, like, when I grow up, I'm going to have so much money that I never have to worry about money. Yeah. But never worrying about money 
started to translate to being responsible with money. So, so, you know, my child brain was just like, Hey, I can easy come easy go. I'll never worry about money that like, I'll never give money any consideration. And so, right. so anytime I would get money in my bank account, like I would drain it as fast as I could. And the second part of that is I felt this, this need to have pressure in order to be able to perform. So, you know, if I had a lot of money in my bank account, yeah. then I wouldn't have this pressure to work as hard. And so mm -hmm. I was unknowingly getting rid of my money as fast as I could in order to create this false pressure. to. Oh my gosh. Wow. A lot of this is really landing with me for a lot of different reasons. I mean, I had parents who only, only fought about money. I feel like I have some money issues to heal myself. Also, I deal with a lot of money issues with our community a lot where they're dealing with their family issues. But more than anything, it's like, you know, you're on this path to try and find like, what's the thing that's going to make you happy. And you think the thing that's going to make you happy is not really the thing that's going to make you happy. It's about healing, like what's happening inside totally. to be like happy with yourself, just no matter what, you know, cause yeah, yeah. Money's not the root of all evil. It's also not the root of happiness either. I mean, money is a completely neutral. It's, it's a tool, right? Yeah, it's simply a store of value. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones that place meaning on money. Yeah. And, and like we talked about earlier in the conversation, like there needs to be a balance. Like money is not the root of all evil. It also isn't the solution to all of the world's problems. It's simply yeah. a store of value. So if you've created value in the marketplace, you have stored that value via money. But, but money alone is nothing unless we use that money to serve our values, unless we use that money to create the life that we want to create. So for me, you know, when I talk about being a wealth coach, it's really important to define what wealth actually is. And, and for me, wealth is, is four things. It's freedom of time, freedom of relationships, freedom of health, and freedom mm -hmm. of mind. And that last one, freedom of mind is really important because all the money in the world doesn't matter if I'm like staring at the ceiling, laying my bed at, at night, yeah. and, you know, stressed out about, about what's happening, right? Like money hasn't bought me anything at that point. And the fact is you can't outrun a poor relationship with money. Like I have clients with businesses that are massive, like mid nine figures, like, like 450 million, yeah. you know, revenue. And they're talking about these same problems. Like they're, yeah. they're lying, you know, staring at the ceiling at night, super stressed out. Like don't even want to get up and face the day because they're so stressed out about their business. So you can't outpace it by earning more. You have to dig in and understand like where the stress is coming from. It's such a good lesson and something that everyone needs to work on if that's what's going on. I mean, I think consistent mindset work and consistent healing is so important if you want to keep the money that you make and like use it for, you know, enjoyment. <laughs> Cause I mean, at the end of the day, you know, as you're saying, like money is energy, it's a, it's a resource, it's a tool for, for whatever we need it for in our lives and to support us and all those things. And at the end of the day, like if you're not healing what's going on inside, you're going to just continue having the same problems. Now, what were some of the ways that you were able to get over some of your self sabotaging behavior? I mean, the first and foremost one is awareness, like, yeah. like digging in and being like, wait a minute, like, why am I from? deploying? Yeah. Well, why am I deploying this capital so fast? And what I found was I was addicted to risk. And so from a, from a Ooh. neuroscience perspective, wow. when I we take a too. risk, <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> when we take a risk and that risk pays off. So say I invest $10,000 in a company and I get $20,000 back Yeah. now. The next time I need to bet more and win more in order to get that same feeling of satisfaction. Okay. So this is called hedonic adaptation, meaning, you know, when we take a risk and it pays off, our brain releases dopamine, serotonin, yes. and endorphins. It creates this feeling of safety and well being. But you have to keep doing more and more and more just to get that same feeling. So this is what was happening. I was I was investing in these companies, and then every time it would pay off, I would need to invest more and more and more and more. So Number one, breaking that, like recognizing and breaking that cycle. And then B, understanding like where that risk addiction came from in the first mm -hmm. place, which was that story I was telling you about, you know, never having to worry about yeah. money. Like I did not respect the energy of money because it was just, it was money in, money out. Like I never, I never appreciated how hard I had to work to get mm -hmm. it in the first place. Yep. I love that. 
This has been such a helpful episode and I know that it's going to help so many people, the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who listen and download this show. So Mike, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and all these incredible tips. Uh, where can everyone find you? Yeah, uh, I'm on Instagram at mbrown.co. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about my coaching programs, unbreakablewealth.com, sign up for the newsletter, send a weekly newsletter with uh, you know, personal stories, anecdotes, and investing tips. And uh, yeah, uh, come check it out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching this episode today. If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pick up a copy of my best selling book. The desired brand effect stand out in a saturated market with a timeless jewelry brand it has gotten on seven bestsellers list and has over 130 five-star reviews and i hope that you enjoy it so pick up your copy today and let me know what you think